Kate and Michelle. If Michelle, you want to say hello. Hello. So we'll be talking about security. Um, and just so you know, um, this video, this webinar is being recorded and it's going up on YouTube. And I'm going to pass you over to Michelle to talk a little bit about what we're going to be chatting about. Okay, thanks, Annie. So, um, some of the kind of key things that we want to talk about in this webinar are verification identification in a, an online process, online voter fraud and online identity issues, different ways that fraud might be mitigated, including some of the security arrangements you might expect to see, how data is handled online and how this will help meet GDPR and other regulatory expectations. So there are a number of key tenants that are needed as part of ensuring a democratic process can be trusted by those who take part. Firstly, the results should not be open to outside influence from those who should not be part of the process. Second, the data captured and results that emerge is a correct representation of what was heard through the process. And finally, that the data captured is kept private and not able to be easily captured by, those, by external actors and those who are outside of the process itself. And developing appropriate security, data protection and verification processes are by the ways you try to ensure these three key points take place, regardless of whether or not you, your democratic process is taking place using digital approaches, non-digital approaches, or as most of us do, uh, a mix for your uh, for what you're carrying out. So, all democrat well, all democratic processes should be protected in this way. Exactly how you handle it and the measures you put in place is likely to follow a little bit of a risk-based approach. Um, yeah. So basically, uh, when you are carrying out your, your democratic process, you really want to make sure that only the right people, however you're defining this, are able to participate. Um, while all democratic processes should be protected in this way, exactly how this is handled is, is likely to follow a, a risk-based approach. For instance, democratic activities around contentious issues are more at risk from individuals or organisations trying to either disrupt that process or try to influence the outcomes. While in respect to kind of participatory budgeting, activities involving uh, sizable budgets are far more likely to attract attention and attempts to subvert the activity in some way or another. However, when you're using digital approaches, it becomes even more important to think about these issues because the ways this, this kind of disruption or this influence can be kind of can be introduced are perhaps a bit easier to do or a little bit less obvious to those who are watching the process. So for instance, if you're trying to change the result of an offline PV voting process, you'd have to find a whole number of individuals who are going to take part in that process and convince them or coerce them into voting for the project you want. Or you'd have to deliberately convince a large number of people to attend your, the offline process and then vote for your preferred pro project. Now this isn't impossible, there are kind of cases where this has like reportedly happened, however it can be relatively challenging. But if you're then thinking about it in an online process, if the only means by which an individual's identity is verified is using an email address and a password, well it's, it's relatively easy to kind of create multiple email addresses and then use each of these email addresses to uh, vote as, as part of that process. And this, you know, as such, it can be a lot easier to influence the result in, in that way. So, Annie, do you want to kind of take us through the, the next couple of slides? Yeah, so what you were saying, Michelle, about sort of certain groups of people, um, verification online and offline kind of is ensuring that we call it the right people. Um, but that's how a council or community might define that. So it might be people from a specific postcode or specific area, or it could be a certain demographic of people. So uh, young people, for instance, or um, a certain community that you're trying to target and how you're going to verify that that's the group of people that are going onto your system and how you verify them. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about verification. Um, so verification is basically the process of establishing the truth accuracy or validity of something um, and quote the verification of official documents however that might be defined so security we're talking about digital security 
um, in this case, which refers to um, ways of protecting computers' account data or files from intrusion of an outside user. So protection of online identity. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in reference to voting um, and registration when you're doing digital. So your PB process. So some security considerations, while all processes should be protected from corruption, uh, the security concerns um, should be a risk-based based approach. So it could be that activities based around sizable budgets or issues are more at risk of people trying to hack the processes. So that might be like large budgets of money. Whereas if you're just doing something to do with idea generation or deliberation, it might be that the risk is a lower based approach. So you might not want to put as much verification or security on that. So it's some things to consider when you're doing that. So there are a number of ways that um, verification can be done when we're talking about online. So for general elections, um, so municipalities or across Europe, they use ID cards. But in Scotland, we don't have a sort of general national ID or and the UK, sorry, a, a national identity card scheme. Um, but there's things like Young Scott card and national entitlement card, um, which can provide some of these purposes. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a bit. I'd also say as well there, that if you are a membership organization, you might well have membership numbers that you could use for uh, some of those kind of verification processes. Uh, or if you, I don't know, are the NHS, you might have a common domain at the end that you would kind of, you know, could use as a means of kind of helping to, to sift through who you, you do and don't want to be kind of part of, of that process. Yeah. And when we're doing sort of verification, I'm going to give you some sort of um, key things to consider uh, at the end of going through some of the options. But um, to bear in mind, very few people are likely to sit and fill in a long registration form. So if you're trying to engage a lot of people uh, to consider not putting lots of information in, so having to fill in lots of registration numbers in a document uh, that's not easy to fill in or user, user friendly, uh, you might also want to think about who's got access to the verification data. So um, say for example, you've got an administrator and they're in the back office of your site. Um, you might want to consider who's got access to this. So recognizing these individuals and what sort of access to data that they have. And I'm sure Michelle will touch on that in a little bit about data. Just add in there as well, is that it, it's not just kind of about the, the people at the back end, it's, it's also about the individuals who are taking part in that process. So if we think, if you, for instance, for whatever reason, choose to uh, say that you'll use national insurance numbers, as a means to verify individuals. Think about who is less likely to have access to national insurance numbers. It's, it's likely to be those who are, who, you know, people may struggle to find it if they're unemployed, um, because often a lot of people may go to look at their pay slips and, you know, it may be something that's buried way down in, in kind of the bottom of various drawers, or equally in kind of UK national insurance uh, cards only go to those above a certain age. So you're inherently excluding those who are under the age of 16, for instance, which can kind of introduce kind of bias into your system. And if you're kind of carrying out your PV process, really passionate about helping to hear from underrepresented groups, think about the, the types of verification data you're, you're asking for and how you can make sure that what you're asking for is both not too onerous on the individual, but also the types of information and data that underrepresented groups and others may be more more likely to have to hand as well. And then just, just the final point as well there to say is that, as, as Annie said, she's completely right that, that people may not, you know, have time to fill in long onerous documents asking, you know, for date of birth, you know, full address. It's, it's also, you've got to think about it from the user perspective and their privacy concerns, or they may not want to share that data with uh, a council or with, with you, depending on who you are. And, and so, you know, you're, you're building in just those additional barriers that may help to put people off for reasons that aren't just you know, related to time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so some more considerations are just like, again, what Michelle was touching on, who's got access to this information. 
um, not even just the data, the verification data, um, like their name, username, email, things like that, but how people have voted. So if they vote for a specific project, um, maybe you need to consider the individuals that have that sort of information. Um, and how is the information clearly communicated to citizens or users up front? So if you're voting, um, are you telling your citizens how the system works? Are you telling them the way the security works? Um, and what are the citizens and staff roles in designing this security? So is it just the staff that are designing the security or are you putting it out to the community to help you design the security? So by using that, like by sort of putting out citizens and saying, okay, how would you, how would you make this secure? Um, it kind of helps protect that sort of unfairness. So, um, or sort of balances out conflicts of interest. Um, so if a community group helps set out the rules, they can shape them for their own advantage. So for example, they might think um, that this is gonna happen, X, Y, and Z is gonna happen. So they put a security measure in place so it doesn't happen. So it's kind of that balance of how much power and data should the person in charge have, or sh what Michelle was saying, should it be citizens as well that have some of that access? And um, so you want to consider that as well. Um, I think also, kind of, as I can say, I think bringing in citizens is a really good way of kind of doing some of that light touch user testing as well. So helping, asking them to help you mitigate that tension between asking for too much information and creating a, a light touch user friendly system. And so I, I think Annie's completely right in, in you know, pushing that, that as being kind of something that you could think about when you're designing your overall process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some sort of reasons why you might actually, you know, some people go, oh, well, why do we even need security in the first place? So some examples I'm going to talk about um, why you actually need it. So if you're doing something to do with digital or voting online, um, these are some of the reasons. So the first one is Ghent. So Ghent is in Belgium. Um, and this is an example of how things slightly went wrong with their voting system. So people had to give their name and identification number of the national register. So basically they can check if someone lives in the city. 61% um, of the participants thought this was a safe method and the other percent didn't. So for the local government, um, this kind of identification was basically the most ideal trade-off between safety, accessibility and cost efficient. So there's a balance there of sort of getting people um, you know, engaged and participating online, but also how secure is it um, and is it cost effective? Um, so for the local government, it was a good method. Um, but working with EID, so this is the sort of system that they used. Um, so you basically have to log into a system with a chip of your identity card, um, which can take a little, it can take a long time. So it's not really an option of accessibility. It's not a very accessibility option accessible option. Um, so 48% thought this was user friendly enough, um, but 44% did not. So it's almost split in how user friendly it was. Um, and a lot of people had questions about the willingness of participants to give their, you know, their identity, their, their personal information onto a system that they weren't sure about. Um, so people wanted to log in, um, but the system said that their ID number was already in use. So this is what happened with a fraud case. So they're trying to log into the system, um, but their ID number, someone had already been using it. Um, so when the staff, they looked into the back office of the website, they found some unusual activity from one of the IP addresses. And after some research, they discovered that um, this was the IP address that already voted so they had basically taken these ID numbers of the victims and used that to their advantage to vote. So an official complaint was made, um, but because the official supervision period was already expired, um, it was past that sort of point of no return kind of thing. Um, so the complaint went to the Privacy Commission and they suggested to use a system for online voting that was less susceptible um, sus susceptible to fraud. Um, and that would mean the use of EID. So the local government defended their choice of not using the system um, because of the 44% that questioned the user friendliness. But um, so basically 
the fraud turned out to be a person who had a sports club. So that's how they managed to gain the, identica the identification of all these members that had ID numbers, um, because you basically need them to register in sports clubs. So they used them to vote for the projects. Um, and in Belgium, you only need an EID to fill in your tax form. So it, this can take a lot of time, but it is fraud proof. However, when it's used in online participation, the numbers will drop dramatically. So people, because it takes time, um, people, it takes too long for people to engage and fill in sort of form. So it's two things to consider in that. Um, I'm going to pass you over to Michelle because she's got another more local example. Um, if Michelle, you want to talk a little bit about another example where verification has gone maybe wrong or something has happened. Yeah, so in some plot of that is in Dundee. So we were involved in supporting a participatory budgeting process in Dundee um, last year, the year before, something like that. Um, and we're supporting uh, the council to use a platform called Open Active Voting, which is run by friends and colleagues from us in Citizens Foundation in Iceland. Um, during the, the PB process itself, um, what, when we kind of ran the numbers at the end of, of the kind of voting period, we identified that there were a couple of suspicious voting patterns, uh, voting from a number of uh, the same IP addresses and voting in ways that had like raised red flags, again, in the back end of, of the software. Um, as we'll talk a little bit about later, also, you know, most of the, the software and tools that are out there to support online PV processes have algorithms that help flag suspicious voting activity. Suspicious voting activity being, for instance, uh, people, one IP address voting multiple times for the same project, uh, it, especially, for instance, in a very short period of time. And so in, in Dundee, the, the example we're talking about, we it was noticed that there had been one IP address voting a number of times for, for the same projects. Now, it's very difficult for us to tell in, in that instance whether or not it was a case of attempted fraud because that, that pattern is suspicious. However, there could be some very valid reasons for it. So for instance, if you are working in a university, you're likely to have the same IP address as lots of other people who are working in a university and thus lots of other students who are based in a university. And so you could, for instance, imagine people around a, a certain location like a university all looking to kind of vote for, for a similar idea, something that a student on site is, is busy campaigning for or, or something similar. Alternatively, um, other places where the same IP address might be used multiple times would be a library where lots of citizens or individuals who don't have access to um, the internet at home may choose to go in and vote there. So, so it was really difficult for us to, to know whether or not there had been a, a significant problem here uh, in terms of at least kind of whether, or, if you could scratch that bit, Annie, that'd be great. It was really difficult for us to understand whether or not there had been a case of attempted fraud carried out here. However, when we ran the numbers and, and looked at it, we were able to be confident that the numbers that had taken part in this and perhaps instigated uh, an incident of fraud hadn't actually swayed the results and the outcome. So that allowed us to kind of be, feel reassured both kind of with the partners and, and with the council and move forward from there. But it's again one of those interesting examples that shows how when you introduce a larger budget, perhaps the appetite or the risk profile of the activity increases slightly and you perhaps need to think about these ideas of security and verification. Cool. Thank you. Um, I've got another example, but it's not quite to do with voting. It's more registration. Um, and actually being able to vote in the first place. So another example was a community uh, somewhere in Scotland. So they used a tool um, and basically they needed a postcode to log in. So citizens could register, um, but basically because their postcode was not validated, they could not vote. Uh, and the community or the people working on the, on the tool, they were wondering why most people could vote. 
but not a specific group of people. So it turned out that this specific group of people, they all had the same postcode. Um, and basically that postcode had just been missed out of the list. Um, but because it's such a simple error to fix, basically you just need to add that specific postcode into the back office. Um, but some, I'm just going to go over some recommendations uh, very quickly. But one of the things that we recommend is to test any piece of software used for attempted fraud even up to two weeks in advance um, of starting your digital process. And so by doing this, you can ask trusted, trusted staff or citizens uh, to register and vote on the system uh, and even attempt to, to vote multiple times. And this can check um, to see if your, uh, your system is flagging up anything uh, to make sure it's working properly. And um, I'll say as well, it's, it's, not, it, it's also about um, kind of linking to the example you were talking about there, Annie. It, it's really good because it allows you to check if there are any errors in the data that you're using to check it against. Um, so for instance, you know, what the example you're talking about there isn't necessarily a fraud case, but it's a failure in the registration systems. And just making sure you kind of sense check that with a range of different possibilities can really help reduce your risk when you're running a process that you then find out you've accidentally disenfranchised uh, a number of relational people from, from the process, which I've heard is, is not an ideal way to, to run your participatory budgeting process. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be missing people out. <laughs> and it's better to, do, better to find that out before you launch than afterwards. But again, if you have launched your, your, your participatory budgeting process and you've found this out as you're going, do think about how you kind of communicate that and reach back out to those audiences who have potentially been missed off so that they don't get kind of frustrated, disengaged from the overall process, or indeed start questioning the validity or, or you know, of, of the overall outcomes. Absolutely. Um, I'm just going to go through, um, hopefully very quickly, because I know we don't have too much time, but some of the verification options you can use and some of the pros and cons in terms of security and accessibility. Um, so these are some of the options that um, most of the tools, the digital tools, if you're doing PB, uh, have, but not all. So just bear in mind. Um, so first one, very simple, email. Most people have an email address of some sort um, and it's not asking for a lot of personal information. So you could, so that's just an example there. It might ask for a username. It doesn't have to be your name. Uh, type in your email and password. And then what, usually what will happen is you might even get a, an, email, a, an email saying, please verify that this is you and you'll click on that and it'll take you back to the site. Um, however, not everyone has an email. So for example, school children um, and having to go through your email to verify might take a bit of time. So not everyone will do this. And again, it's not very secure. So anyone can create an email and register it. So it's relatively easy to hack and influence the outcome. Um, it could be more secure if you're an organization. So you might have an email address that all participants use. So for example, at nhs.net or something else that's organizational, um, you know where that group of people are from. Social media. So it's very quick. Most people have a Facebook or a Twitter, um, you know, uh, some sort of social media these days. Um, individuals don't have to use an email address. So most instances, you'll need an email address anyway to sign up for the social media account. So for Facebook, you do need an email. I'm, I'm pretty sure Twitter as well you do. Um, but however, um, it requires people participating on another platform, so using social media. And again, there's some ethical concerns with using social media. So young people, they might be able to be found more easily if they've signed up using their Facebook account. Um, and are you encouraging people to sign up to a social media platform? So we can't necessarily ensure participants' identity is private if you're asking them to do that. Um, and this could also lead to data being shared or perceptions that their data might be shared or their identity. Um, I think that's a really important one at present where there are concerns around, uh, concerns from some quarters around kind of uh, Facebook and uh, other social media platforms about kind of like how they use the individual's data. So I, I think that's the ethical concerns around that are, are definitely something to bear in mind. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. To oh no, sorry. <laughs> um, we all know that's a, a personal, 
personal point of, of interest for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, postcodes. This is another one that people use quite a lot for PV. Um, it's great if you are designing a process where you've got separate regional uh, processes going on or budgets. So say you've got um, four communities and they're all voting for one citywide project or they're all voting for their own community project. It's quite good to have a postcode um, because it's easy to verify. Everyone living in that geographic area has one. Um, they might not know it, but they definitely have one and it's easy to look up. Um, um, I would disagree with that actually. Not everyone would have one. So if you're again thinking about uh, people who are homeless, they might not necessarily have a, a postcode that they feel that they can use in that instance. Fair enough. So Sorry. what would they, <laughs> would they not have a postcode if it was if they're sort of staying in an area or is that not how it works? So people on the street wouldn't necessarily yeah, have true. a postcode. And again, from my perspective anyway, those are kind of, you know, some of those underrepresented groups that might be already very traditionally excluded from uh, democratic processes. Uh, so, you know, thinking about that or thinking about how you could actively reach out to the, you know, if you're using postcode verification, think about how you can reach out to those individuals who identify with kind of living in whatever way in, in an area and providing them with access to a postcode of, uh, uh, you know, some support services around could be a means of getting around that. But you have to kind of very proactively. Yes, so some sort of organisation postcode instead of a house. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the other thing is like, would you, it could be some where you work or play, you've got that down as like where you work or play or... Um, associate with you could use that postcode instead of where you live um, I don't know how yeah I guess it's just designing the process to make it suit um, but again it might not consider if you've got a family living in one area and um, people who live in multiple you know multiple occupancy so and you, you need to consider that um, people signing up with the same postcode um, you know 20 people living in that area or that household can all still vote without it being flagged up or blocked. Oh yeah, and also it can be easily forged. So I could just look up a postcode online or somewhere and just type in a postcode. So it can be easily forged. And um, you can literally just search postcodes or find a region and do it that way. So I guess it's another con against that. So council tax numbers. So these are easily verifiable and harder to fake than a postcode. Um, they're individual to each household, so it would link the PB process directly to tax, but um, it may not take into consideration homes of multiple occupancy, so more than one person living in the house. Um, it, it won't take into account children or young people, um, and finding council tax number might be hard for individuals. So, um, And also, again, it's not really relevant for organisations which are carrying out PB programmes but they might not have access to council tax numbers. So having that data stored somewhere, they, they might not have access to that for verification purposes. Um, but it's another option. Michelle, have you got anything to add on this one? So Young Scott card, um, this is more a uh, Scotland focused, I guess, but a lot of young people um, aged between 11 and 26 have Young Scott cards, but not everyone. So it encourages young people to participate. It promotes their Young Scott card. It's easily accessible and verifiable. However, again, without a secure database, um, organizations like communities, they might not have access to the card numbers to verify identification. So it's having the access to data um, as well. So national insurance or identity card. So I've got an, a Spanish example there, and that's because um, in Madrid, so the, the, got, we've got Madrid Decides, they use national identity cards to verify um, who that person is before they can vote online in their PB process. Um, so their ID cards hold details of name, surname, surname uh, date of birth, address, parents, um, their residential address, city, um, and a photograph as well, obviously. Um, not everyone will have an ID card, so people lose them, they might not have one, and this might require extra work. 
So, you know, for example, giving out personalised codes to people so that they can vote online or um, participate online. Um, and again, some ID cards are only for a certain age group. So in Iceland, they've got the same thing, a, a national identification card, but it only verifies those aged 14 and above. And you also, you also need a passport or driving licence to apply to, to get a national identity card. So again, it's going to be excluding some people um, and, and we don't have ID cards in the UK as a whole yet. So that's another thing to consider. I wouldn't necessarily say yet, that implies they're coming. Um, it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting topic and one perhaps not for now, where there's a whole range of tensions around such, such systems. However, I know government is always exploring how they can do perhaps online verification without using ID cards. And so there are a couple of schemes there in, in the, you know, that may emerge in the future to be confirmed or to be continued. <laughs> I love it. Um, so um, a few a few more ones, SMS text voting verification. So most, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with this, but you might get, um, if you've got a mobile, um, you can put in your number to the system and it'll send you a verification code just to confirm that that's you. Um, there's different ways that this can work as well. So again um you've got another cut so you've got the the good thing about it is the verification system you've got another contact for further verification it's almost like an email but via mobile um but again it's mul it's possible to cheat because you can have multiple sim cards or even multiple phones and um there's an additional cost to implement this as well um my account so this is already being used in local authorities across Scotland. So I can't say this, this is a code is SAMH2 technology, which enables authentication process um, to actually integrate with other digital tools. Um, so this is encouraging the use of my account to access things like council services. Um, so at the moment, 25 councils or services are using my account across Scotland. So um, to use my account, you begin by registering for an online account. Um, again, you'll have a username and password. Uh, you only need to complete this registration once, and then you can use that username to access public services, such as you know things like paying a ta council tax bill or requesting a car parking permit or things like that. However, this is another option to verify. So... The things against this is, again, it's an additional cost to implement into a verification. There's no guarantee that mygov.scot will allow uh, for authentication to be integrated. Um, and without a secure database to store information, it might not be the case that communi communities could use this verification method. Okay, so I've got a couple more to go through, but the electoral roll data. So this is obviously a trusted verified database. So it's linked to individuals. Um, it encourages people to register to vote for elections as well as potentially participatory budgeting. Um, I'm not sure if there's any examples of people using this as verification. I'm not sure. Do you know, Michelle? Not off the top of my head, no. I'm not sure if this is one where people are have raised it as a possible option or whether or not it's one that's taken place anywhere. I'd, I'd love to do a little bit more, more digging in and research. Yeah. Again, it's, yeah, it's one of these things, it's that thing where you need, um, if you have access to that data, I don't know whether the data from the electoral roll data will be accessible to local authorities. Um, and again, not everyone is on the electoral roll. So many young people, students, or people who move house often, or those that are a bit younger, so not everyone might be on it. Um, so it's another thing to consider. What else? Oh, this is the last one. So the individual code, um, there's many ways that this could work. So it could be that an individual code could be sent to every household in the area for them to register to participate. So it could be literally a letter or it could be via, I don't know if you've got access to people's emails or things like that. But um, it ensures that one person uh, has one vote um, they've got the name of the participant and the code entered on registration must match to be verified. And it could encourage a high turnout if every 
a resident receives a paper ballot or a ballot um, if they receive it and they and they use it. However, um, again, it's that um, it's that thing about being having access to data. So whether local authorities have the capacity uh, to access available data to verify using this method. And again, there'll be an additional cost to implement this. So getting ballots out to every household, uh, for instance, would cost money. Um, so I've gone over some of the recommendations, but I'm going to pass you back on to Michelle to talk about reliability and security. So kind of building on, on where we got to and talking about kind of some of the verification approaches, uh, it's also really important to make sure that the, the digital software and the data that's captured through the BPB process cannot be accessed. Um, this is both for ensuring that uh, wrong people or people in general don't gain access to the software and edit any results. So thinking back to what we were talking about around verification, make sure that the right people get to vote, making sure that the right people only get to vote once rather than edit and create false results. But also it's really important to make sure that the data that is captured, that can often include personal data like names and email addresses from how people have registered, isn't accidentally leaked to the, to the wrong people. And this kind of links to thinking about kind of GDPR requirements to ensure that you're uh, making sure people's personal data that you're processing is, is kept secure and safe. So there are a number of security standards that can help indicate the robustness of a piece of software and show commitments that a software developer or provider has made to strong data management processes. Uh, a common one in this space is ISO IEC 27001. Um, but one thing to remember before kind of making sure, you know, hunting down only tools of software that have this uh, specific uh, specification or standard is that a lot of digital engagement platforms are in an emerging space. Some and some organizations may have chosen not to achieve this optional certification. Not having gone for it doesn't mean that robust processes are not being followed. Having gone from it means that robust processes are being followed. So what you want to do if you're looking at a piece of software that doesn't have the like kind of this security standard in place is to kind of run through a number of questions that we'll explore in, in a little bit. It's also really important that when we're thinking about security, we're being mindful that it isn't just a function of the software. So you can use the most secure software out there, but if the human processes around it are flawed, then you risk compromising the overall security of your participatory process. So the sorts of questions that you might want to think about when uh, choosing or, or selecting a digital engagement platform. Firstly, I'd say that um, you want to make sure you want to explore who owns the data that's being uh, generated through this process. So if you're using a, a piece of software that you're not hosting yourself on your own servers, you should make sure you've got an agreement in place stating you've got full ownership of, of the data. So this means you can ensure that the data being collected, processed and handled is subject to your own data policy standards. And it also means you're not at risk of said company being bought out and the data that has been collected being used or, or you know, repurposed or, or sold in, as part of that company's being set out. You should also make sure that you're able to access a copy of the data in a, a common format after the engagement activity has taken place. Make sure you're able to download it, analyze it and play about with it in, in some form or another. And we tend to kind of you know, suggest CSV files or Excel files are a good way of being able to do that. You also want to ask um, where the data is stored. So where the, the physical location of servers is, is really important. Data stored in different geographic areas will be bound by laws in most countries. So if the servers are based in America, for instance, then kind of the how the data is used, how it can be opened to security services or others asking to interrogate it are bound by US laws. So, you know, that, that's something very much to think about. If you're hosting the software for digital engagement yourself, you'll likely already have servers 
based in the kind of correct country or in suitable countries. But if you're using software that is stored on the servers of a software provider, it's really, as I said, important to ask where they're based. So if you're running a PDB process based in Scotland or kind of across other countries of the UK, you'll want to make sure that uh, they're based either within the European economic area or covered by what is termed an adequacy decision. So this helps you kind of make sure that you can comply with GDPR legislation. And there's a website that will make sure there's a link to underneath this video where you can kind of check what countries are covered by these adequacy decisions. If, for instance, so kind of the, the classic example there, thinking about it, is uh, the, the states. So a lot of, uh, for instance, Amazon servers and, and other pieces have servers that are based, for instance, perhaps in America. But there's something that is called a privacy field, which acts as, as a barrier, makes it so that the, the, the servers that you're using are effectively in the EU, even though they're physically based within the United States. Another question that you want to ask yourself is who has access actually to the data, as Annie was talking about a little bit earlier. So there's multiple sides to this who has access question. So firstly, when you're designing your PD process and you're, you're setting up the software, think about who from your organization has access to the full set of data. As we said, there could be some personal data in there, such as names and email addresses. So perhaps what you might want to do is uh, set up different access le levels at the back end. So for instance, having only one or two people who have full admin access and access to all of this, this data, while enabling others to have access only to moderation options. In this way, you're, you're starting to restrict the, the data to only those who, who need to have it. Linked to that, you'll also want to think about, as you know, again, going back to the human side of things I was talking about earlier, you'll also want to think about what sort of types of security settings you could put in place to reduce someone accessing the, the data using the login details from people who from your organization. So, for instance, somebody could deliberately or accidentally acquire somebody's password and use it to try and log in, and especially if you're somebody with admin um, rights, then you could be giving that individual quite a significant uh, chunk of personal data in, in those instances. So think a little bit about making sure that all of the team who have high level access to this have strong passwords. So with, you know, passwords that are of eight characters or more, mixes of capital letters, lowercase numbers, symbols, not things that people could easily identify with you. And also really importantly, making sure it's not written down the number of times I've worked with organizations where people have a password that they've written down on a piece of paper and then put near their computer, it's not necessarily helping to create the most secure uh, situation for the individual <laughs> engagement there. Another thing that you might want to think about is introducing what's called two-factor authentication. So this is um, where not only do you need your login details, but you will additionally need to add in a, a small code, which has been, for instance, potentially sent to your phone or sent to a specific app that allows you to confirm, completely confirm that it is indeed you that is trying to access that system. The other angle that you should think about in this way is whether or not the software provider themselves have access to the raw data behind the scenes. So if a software provider is hosting the digital tool or engagement platform, uh, in some instances, they might have access to, to the back end, to, to the kind of really raw data, again, like which individual has said what and at what time frame. So you might want to talk to them and ask what sort of security processes they themselves have put in place to ensure that this access isn't abused. Some companies, for instance, may background check all employees that they have coming on board, whereas other systems, such as open access voting that we talked a little bit about earlier, have, uh, do not themselves actually have access to, to the raw data. And instead, that, only, that kind of raw data is only generated after the fact, after the, the voting has closed at, at the end. The final thing I've mentioned as well when it comes to thinking about who has access to data is actually about the physical security of the service that they're using themselves. 
are the premises uh, on which those servers based themselves secure, for instance, with restricted access, potentially CCTV footage and, and things like that, making sure that it, people can't break into those, those kind of systems. Now, on a smaller PB process, perhaps thinking about the, that physical security of service isn't necessarily as important, but if you're running a, a bigger scale engagement process or something like that, that's where those issues are, are really important to kind of start thinking about. I'd also say when you're kind of talking about data, and again, it goes back to what you're saying earlier, Annie, I think it's really important that you want to think very early about how you're communicating with participants about who has access to that data and making sure that you're kind of, you know, sharing it, potentially co-designing it with participants up front to help them understand a little bit more about kind of what's going on and how and what their expectations from this can be. The next thing I just want to kind of talk about a little bit in this uh, space is the reliability of the software and the servers themselves. So you're running a digital engagement process. You want to make sure that when somebody goes to your website, the kind of website is actually working, that the, the platform is actually up. Um, a lot of software at times, you know, can slip off uh, or it could be the subject of a deliberate attack. To, to try and prevent people from engaging on, on that platform. Or if you have a lot of people looking to engage on a particularly contentious issue or engaging a, a very large population, it could, you know, there are potential risks that too many people try and load the site at the same time, leading the site itself to crash. So when you're kind of having, like thinking about choosing that tool, you want to make sure that, you know, the, the software provider is talking about the kind of guaranteed uptime that they have for, for that software um, and uh, that they've got kind of some of those performance guarantees built into that. You also really want to make sure that they are backing up your data kind of on a, a regular basis and wanting to kind of ask them about how quickly they could restore your data if, for instance, the site goes down and crashes and all of that kind of immediate data has been lost, how can they, you know, what backups have they got, how frequently has it been captured and how quickly can they get that back up and running for you. I think one of the other really important things to kind of pick up as well is around vulnerabilities. So when we're kind of talking about the risks of people trying to disrupt the process, what they could try and do either deliberately or accidentally is try and hack into, into the system or, or change the system in some way or another so it uh, results are registered in quite the same way. So you're looking for software developers and uh, software providers who have really tested their services for automated and opportunistic hacks in this way. And there's uh, a number of um, methods by just some. So pen testing or penetration testing is the way that this is that people will check for this. And in the UK, you, it's recommended that people look for platforms that have been approved as part of the, the check system. Again, as with kind of some of the other standards things, not being check tested doesn't mean that a software provider hasn't thoroughly pen tested their tool, but if they haven't, if they're not talking about having it tested in this way, you should really be kind of asking about it and making sure that your IT teams are happy with the answers that the software provider has, has provided you with. The other piece as well there really to kind of flag is to chat with a software provider about how they do handle the situation or a situation in which a security vulnerability is identified. Is it something that they'll be able to kind of go away and mend very, very rapidly within you know, 24 hours? Or are they not providing regular security updates to the, the tool that they're busy uh, supporting in that way? The, the final thing that I'd just say as well to help ensure that you're complying with uh, GDPR regulation is chat with the software provider about how you can ensure the rights of individuals are uh, enabled. So under GDPR legislation, all individuals have a, a number of key rights uh, that they can exercise at, at any time. Uh, 
So one is the right to know what data an organization holds about them. Another is a uh, right to, for data to be corrected. Another is a right for uh, data to be about them to be deleted. Now, none of these rights are absolute. There's always kind of some variance, but you want to be making sure when you're bringing a software provider into some of these processes that you're thinking very much about how these rights can be enabled as far as, as they can. And then Annie, I don't know if you had any other issues you wanted to, to discuss quickly at this point in time. Um, not really. I think we're going to go more in detail in the inclusion webinar, but it's just a little bit about um, online safety and um, protection, online protection and things like that. Um, but we're going to talk more about that in the inclusion webinar. I, I think that's that's a really important one to talk about because it's when we're talking about security, we don't just need to want to be talking about the security of the process. We want to be talking about kind of the security and safety of participants within that that process as well. I think there are kind of while I think kind of digital platforms are a, a really great way of kind of reaching out to a, a wider subset of society, helping people to engage at times that best suit them, in ways that best suit them, rather than requiring everyone has the slot between 6.30 and 8.30 on a cold, rainy February night free. There are always going to be kind of other potential issues or differences about using a digital platform to engage than you do necessarily see offline. So you are potentially asking people to uh, carry out what is political discourse in spaces that are visible to a much wider range of individuals and potentially um, be recorded. That's kind of again another, another slight shift and, and perhaps one to think about as you're designing your, your PB process. At what point are you going to be taking that website down and what are you going to be doing with the, the data afterwards and as we kind of talked about the whole way through think again about how you're communicating that to participants so that they can understand what they're, they're putting out there and, and what that looks like. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I ran out of words, Annie. No, that's good. Or right, cool, because we've just, uh, we've got to the end. So, yeah, so the next webinar um, we'll be running is the inclusion and how you do that specifically more towards digital um, and making the case for digital PB, community mapping, but we've got all of our uh, webinar coverage up on our YouTube channel, so make sure you check them out. Um, and I think that's us, unless you've got anything else to add. Cool, well I'm gonna turn this off. <laughs>